Hi, everyone. We're going to give everybody a few more seconds to log on and then we'll get started. All right, so my name's Kelsey Helsper and welcome to our webinar on play um, and developing play skills for your child with autism. Um, I'm a behavior analyst at Beerman and with me is. Hey guys, I'm Christina Gallagher. Um, I'm also a behavior analyst as well as a certified special education teacher. I for our clients here at Beerman. And I'm really excited to dig into play with you guys today and, and to learn more about it. So throughout the webinar, we will both be guiding this discussion on play. So before we get started on the topic, we are gonna talk about how you can communicate with us throughout this webinar. So um, participation is strongly encouraged and can really help you relate to the content and apply it to your daily life. So you do have some communication options that we'll talk through. Um, in my experience, I've found that using the chat feature is the easiest way to communicate with us. Um, it's easy for me to see as we're presenting so we can stop and um, answer questions as we go. So the chat feature is what I'd encourage you to use, but if you look at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you also have the option to raise your hand or to do the Q&A. But like I mentioned, using the chat is gonna be the easiest and most accessible way for us to chat throughout the presentation. Um, if you go into the chat feature, you can see at the bottom that there's a part that says two and you can do um, one of two things. You can do it to the panelists, which is just Christina and myself, or you could do it to the panelists and all the attendees. It's totally up to you, whatever you feel comfortable with. If we are sharing throughout the presentation any of the examples that you guys provide, we will either way uh, make sure that those are confidential and not use names for those things. But if you have any questions at all, just please feel free to use the chat at any time. So the first thing we're going to do, and we'll have some different polls throughout the presentation, but we're going to take a poll and just make sure that you guys can see all of um, this information. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna launch the poll. It should pop up on your screen and then you guys can just select the answer that applies to you. So this first question is how much experience do you have with ABA? And I'll give you guys a few seconds to answer. All right, so it looks like most of you have added your answer so far. So I'm gonna end the poll. And it looks like the majority of you have been clients of ours for a while. So welcome and welcome to all the newer families as well. We can't wait to talk through this topic with all of you. Okay, so sometimes it takes just a minute to transfer from the poll. it's skipping ahead. Okay, so now let's talk about the objectives of this training. So the first is going to be describe four benefits of play. The next is summarize the six stages of play, classify a toy based on skill level, pinpoint three strategies to use when playing with your child, and select two skills to teach your child during play. So as a perfect introduction to our topic, I'll read you this quote from O. Fred Donaldson that says, children learn as they play. More importantly, in play, children learn how to learn. So let's talk more about why play skills are so important for your child. 
So knowing what to expect out of your child's play can really help support your child as they learn to play with their siblings, with friends, with you, or with peers. And in general, play helps to improve brain function, increase communication and language development, develop and improve social skills, and decrease rigid and repetitive behaviors. So we're gonna take another poll really quick. As we talk through some of those things that are important, um, we wanna know compared to language development, how important is play to you? So let me launch that now. And you guys can feel free to answer. All right, it looks like almost everyone participated. So I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So it looks like the majority of you think that it's equally as important to language development. And they, like I mentioned, they go hand in hand um, and they can work together to improve both skill areas. So that was great. Let's see. Okay. All right, we're gonna jump right into another poll. So we talked through language development, but we also wanna know as compared to decreasing your child's challenging behavior, how important are play skills to you? All right, so I'm gonna share the results. So um, same majority said equally as important. And obviously every kiddo is gonna be different and dealing with um, different challenges. So, um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. We were just curious um, as to where play kind of um, fell for you and your child as a priority. Okay, so. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so since play is such a complex topic, oops, we're gonna discuss um, the different stages of play. So as you look at this um, slide, in the picture on the right, you will see examples of the first five different stages of play that we're gonna talk about. And you can feel free to reference this visual as we go through what they mean on the left. And we'll be taking a poll after this slide as well in relation to these stages. So as we're going through this information, if you wanna try to think about the stage of play that your child spends the most time in, just try to think about that as we talk about what it is. But the first stage is solitary play. And that simply means playing solo without attending to others around you. Onlooker play is also playing solo, but the child may be watching others play. Parallel play is playing near others or with similar toys, but not necessarily interacting with the other individuals around them. Associative play is sharing toys and communicating with others during play. Cooperative play is playing with others with a common goal. And then lastly, which is not pictured here, but we're also going to talk about pretend play which is experimenting with different social and emotional roles. So as I mentioned, we're gonna take a poll and we'd just like to know what stage of play your child engages in the most currently.
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. So it looks like we have a lot of kiddos engaging in solitary play um, and some in all the other categories, but we'll be sure to reference these categories as we talk through the different examples um, and try to be mindful of pointing out examples of um, items and scenarios that might be best for your child engaging in that type of play. So now we're going to talk about pretend play, which starts during the earliest stages of development and evolves as other play skills develop. And this, differently than the other stages of play that we talked about, pretend play can occur simultaneously with other types of play. Some early examples of pretend play could include playing with an item according to its function, such as putting coins in a piggy bank or placing a car down a car ramp. And as more pretend play emerges, the use of props and acting out using roles um, within play may start to occur. But despite the level of pretend play, a certain amount of language development and understanding is required. So as mentioned in the previous slide, there are many different levels of pretend play. And one specific level is symbolic pretend play, which includes object substitution, or completing real actions with pretend items. So as you can see in these picture examples, the boy at the bottom is using a banana as a telephone, and the boys on the far right are using pots and pans as hats and as musical instruments. And we all know that these are not the actual functions of these items. And clearly these children have identified some similarities between the items they're using and the items that these objects are subbing in for. So to understand those similarities and before being able to engage in this type of play, there are some additional skills that would be required. And we call these things component skills. So some examples of component skills that would be required before engaging in symbolic play would be having a vocabulary of a hundred words or more in their repertoire or understanding the size and shape of objects in comparison to other objects. So we're going to stop and take another poll. And this poll just wants to know how often does your child engage in object substitution during play? All right, so it looks like most of your children are not currently engaging in object substitution, and that's okay. Like we talked about, there could be missing component skills there, and they could be working on those component skills now to build up to these types of play. But it is important when thinking about playing with your child, not requiring um, something like this out of them or expecting things like that um, if they're not currently at that level of play. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about advanced pretend play. And as we briefly mentioned in the slide, whoops, skipped ahead on me. As we briefly mentioned in the slide on pretend play, advanced pretend play is on the later end of the spectrum in terms of pretend play. It involves creating roles and using props and like symbolic play to understand the complexities of this kind of play, a child would need to learn certain component skills like having a larger vocabulary and using associative language, such as sorting items by class or feature or function or understanding the details of different events or settings. And I'd like to jump in for a second. So this type of play is super complex and it does not come easily to a lot of children. 
Uh, they, they have to kind of rehearse the scenarios that have occurred at one time or another in their real lives and then give each other roles to make sure that they can reenact it. Uh, a good stepping stone into this style of play is to start rehearsing and modeling things that they've experienced in their real life. So going to the zoo or the swimming pool or even things that they've seen in movies or television shows. All right, so we're gonna have another poll here to talk about advanced pretend play. So we just wanna know how often your child is now engaging in advanced pretend play. Okay, so it looks like the majority of kiddos are not engaging in advanced pretend play, but exactly like Christina mentioned, this can be a really difficult thing um, for children to grasp and understand. So every kiddo is different and every kiddo is going to be at a different stage of play. And we're just here to help you identify what stage that is and how to help you facilitate those play experiences with your child. Okay, so now we're gonna discuss how to set up a play session with your child. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is create a goal. So you can ask yourself, what does your child's play look like now? What would, your, what would you like your child's play to look like? And these goals that you set can be for you and for your child. So when creating a goal, the most important thing is to start small and to think about what's realistic for your child in their current skill development. So some examples might be imitating a simple action that you complete with their toy, your child remaining in the room as you sit next to them and watch them play, initiating play without your guidance, playing independently with a toy in a functional way, or taking turns with the toy. And like I said, those are gonna be individualized to your child and where they're at with their stage of play, but those are just some basic goals and starting points that might be um, realistic for your child. So now what we would like you to do is share in the chat feature, if you feel comfortable, what is one play goal you would like to create for your child? As you guys are answering in the chat, I'm gonna answer this question. Um, someone asked, will we be able to access these slides after the presentation? And the answer is yes. We'll go through that in one of the last slides and I'll let you know exactly how you'll be able to access that info. So I'll just start reading these as they come in. So one goal is independently engage with other children in play. Parallel play is another great goal. Sharing toys. more appropriate sibling play. Serve and return. Which to me sounds a little bit like turn taking, right? So mm -hmm. sharing toys, taking turns with and giving, giving up their toys. Yeah, and sometimes when you're adding different elements like uh, engaging with a sibling or a peer or someone, someone else is involved in play, that can be um, you know, a whole new set of obstacles and things to consider. So um, we'll talk briefly on 
how to um, navigate through that. But we are also um, throughout the next few months going to be offering a play series and there will be one specific to sibling and peer play. So if you are specifically interested in those things, that would be a great webinar to attend. Um, this says one child is great at pretend play. I'd love if my other child would join in play and they would see each other as playmates and more interested in play and not the iPad. So yeah, we'll talk about technology a little bit at the end as well and how we can appropriately use technology and try to facilitate more play with um, different objects as well. So we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. Thank you guys so much for your participation. Oh, this one's going to be me. So let's talk a little bit about um, how we kind of know what our child is ready for. So one thing that we're going to start doing is kind of looking or observing and, and check and see if there's any missing component skills. These are skills that are smaller skills that would kind of help to get to that. Um, so for example, if we're talking about throwing a ball, uh, the child would have to be able to grasp with their hands and they'd have to be able to pull their arm backwards and then kind of release going forward. Um, they'd have to be able to release from their grip. And so these are a lot of small motor movements that um, we would have to maybe teach a specific child that would need help learning to throw a ball. If they aren't able to do those things independently, there's always a way that we can physically assist them or we could practice something different like rolling a ball back and forth first. Uh, changing the size of the ball is also an, often something that would be easier and would help them to be able to um, engage in that sort of ball play. The next one we have is pretend play with a dollhouse. So like, like Kelsey said earlier, pretend play has a lot of layers. So if you aren't really sure what your child can do, I always recommend watching them first and observing. Slowly start to introduce yourself into the activity and model things that they may not be doing yet. Um, one thing might be pretending that the doll is going up the stairs or you know, sitting the doll in the bathtub or maybe putting a baby doll into the crib. Uh, they may begin to copy you if you've seen them able to copy other things that they see. And another really big thing is to always model language while, while you're modeling and showing how to play. Uh, the things that you talk about will um, first and foremost give them the exposure to the language and you might start to see them repeat you as well, which is always a great way of teaching language. Uh, doing a puzzle. So some skills that would be uh, needed to, to do that would be they'd have to be able to pick up the piece and match it to the correct space. If this is difficult for them, try completing puzzles that already have the pictures underneath. So you have those boards that have identical pictures underneath. Some of them have larger knobs so that they're easier to kind of move around and twist into their pieces. Um, those are really good starter puzzles to get, to get kids interested in um, that sort of play. The biggest thing is making sure that it's not too hard. When, when things are too hard, we kind of, you know, walk away and try something different. And so meeting our kids where they are is definitely one of the most important pieces. And so as Christina mentioned, sometimes the materials can be really important to focus on if your child is struggling with a certain skill area maybe the material, um, transferring that to something else can really help with that. So selecting the activity and materials is also an important step. So when you're thinking about selecting the materials, think back to your goal um, and what your ultimate goal is when selecting those materials. So some examples could include when targeting sharing, try to choose items that have multiple pieces so you're able to have repeated sharing opportunities, that repetition, will really help your child to understand the expectation. And then when targeting variance in play, try to choose items that are versatile or more complex, like Christina's example with the dollhouse. You can do several different things with that toy. Um, and so you can teach a variety of different things. And then when targeting imitation within play, Choose items with very clear functions and less distracting items. So if the toy lights up, or makes music, um, and that could be distracting to your child, it might be best to try to think of toys that don't have those distracting elements. 
So it's also important to set up the environment. And one way you can do that is to minimize distractions that are in the environment. And you can do that by removing other toys from the environment or decluttering the space. If you know your child um, goes to different toys frequently or doesn't, a toy doesn't necessarily hold their attention easily, you can remove other toys so that they only have the option to play with that one toy at that time. You could also try turning off electronics if the TV is on or music or something else that could be distracting to them. And then you could also go to a room away from others in the house, so a quieter area or some, somewhere in the house that's gonna be less distracting. And then also, as many of you mentioned with um, engaging with a peer or sibling, you can give instructions to your child throughout the interaction, but you can also um, do some prep work before the interaction begins. If the peer or sibling is able to understand how to um, follow your directions or how to take your prompts, you can even prompt them beforehand with some information that might help them um, to prompt the child during that interaction so that you can be more hands-off and that interaction can um, be more natural for them. And then you wanna be involved. So when it comes to your child's play, your child may not naturally engage with toys according to their function. They may not vary in their play items and they may not engage in pretend play, but that's okay. Try not to get discouraged by that because there are plenty of ways that you can embed yourself into their play experience to help teach them new ways to play. So when you're starting out by doing that, it's important to follow your child's lead like Christina mentioned before. And you can do this by observing their natural play behavior. So just think about things like what toys do they gravitate toward? How do they like to play with those items? Do they already have trouble with someone else manipulating their toys? Every time you come up to play with them or to um, try to engage with them, do they try to take their toy away or do they engage in some type of challenging behavior? Think about things like that and that will help you to guide your interaction with them. So again, as Christina mentioned, try to meet your child where they are and focus on making your play experience with them as positive as you can by easing yourself into that interaction. So if they can't tolerate you being within a close proximity to their items, you can start to pair yourself and do this by talking about the item from a distance. So you don't have to just expect that they're gonna tolerate you right away to ease into that. Maybe you sit 10 feet away from them and you're just talking about what they're playing with. You can also try imitating the noise the toy makes or pairing your voice with the sounds that they already enjoy that the item is making. And as you're easing into your child's play, also work to make those interactions more enjoyable by using silly voices, getting creative about how to play with the toy, or just enhancing the way that they are already liking to play with their toy. You can observe how they're playing with the toy and then just try to think about a way to make that interaction better. And in ABA, we call this pairing yourself with the activity, and it can really be an effective way to make learning something new even better for your child. So let's talk through some pairing examples. So if we were trying to play with a coloring book and crayons, something you might do with your child is draw pictures of your child's favorite TV characters, or maybe animals you saw when you went to the farm. Or if you're not a super great artist, I know I'm not, you could turn the crayons into people and make your coloring book into a tent and have crayons go on a camping adventure. That would be a great example of how you could use those items without having to use their function. Um, or maybe your child likes to sort the items or line them up. So you orient your crayons into a big rainbow and you line them up and make that activity more functional and even better. If you're playing with a toy kitchen, you could set up some cups and use the fruits as, bowling, as a bowling ball to knock them over. You could also pretend to take bites of the food and make silly faces or noises as you eat each one. 
or you could grab a blanket and make a pretend picnic for you and your child and um, use the different items. You could label them as you're getting them out. You could get their stuffed animal friends and have a nice little picnic. Okay, so let's celebrate whenever your child is learning to play in new ways and tolerate new things in their environment. That's a huge deal. And it's definitely something we're celebrating. So you made the blocks into a rocket ship and launched it to the moon and your child imitated you spontaneously. And let's, let's say that never happens. So you reward that new play behavior by doing it all over again, or you expand on that imitation and do other cool things with the rocket ship. But as mentioned before, just follow their lead. If you do something like that and they don't really respond to that, that's okay. You can always try something else. But if they did enjoy it and then like this example, they did something spontaneously that hasn't happened before or hasn't happened with that item before, then you can just keep doing that and give them that repetition and have them follow your lead and imitate your other actions and hope that your child just gains all of those new skills in that super fun activity that you've created. Okay, so while there are many ways that you can make an activity more fun, there are also things that you could do to make that activity not so fun. So some examples of this are asking a bunch of questions. So that might make the activity more difficult for your child, especially if they're used to playing by themselves with that item. And then you're coming in and placing these demands on them to um, answer all of these questions. A great alternative to asking them questions like that would be to narrate what they're doing. So instead of saying, what is that? Or what color? Or tell me what this is. You could just say, that's a doll. The doll's hair is brown. Or just narrate some things that you see within their play items. Removing toys from their hands is also something that can be trigger triggering for some kids, and especially when you're trying to teach them something new. So a great alternative to this could be to have plenty of extra play materials so that you can model play with your own objects without having to take the items from your child. So as we talked about with turn taking, having a lot of items is a great way to have a lot of repetition. If you're trying to teach your child how to play with blocks, for instance, having your own tower to build on instead of having to build on their tower or take their blocks from them to show them how to do that, um, you could both be building or showing them something while they still have their play materials with them. And then you may be asking yourself, how do you know if you're making it not so fun? Just try to observe your child's behavior. So your child may walk away from you or turn their body or move toys to a different space. So just be mindful of those subtle cues about them not enjoying the interaction and try to follow their lead and adjust your behavior to see if you can make it more enjoyable for them. So now I'd love to share again and I'd love to know what interests you when it comes to playing with your child and what are the biggest barriers or your current goals that you have. So answer any or all of those questions, just whatever um, you're going through with your child's play currently, I would love to know about it. Kelsey, we have one question um, okay. on the chat as well about um, specifically to pairing and when it comes to the child, you know, rubbing their legs on the block or kind of kicking their legs back and forth, watching the blocks in between. Um, and, and my idea of that is if you have enough blocks to maybe build a tower next to them and they can kick the blocks over and they can fall down and to create a new um, repetitive, you know, behavior or play that they can do that brings that same sort of enjoyment that they might be finding with seeing the blocks kind of wiggle between them. Yeah, another great idea would be to use something like a towel or um, something where you could put the blocks in and maybe you guys are cooperatively holding the towel and shaking the blocks together um, or making like an earthquake. 
Um, I love that so much. Yeah, anything, like Christina said, just focusing on what they love about playing with those blocks and just trying to make that cool or exciting for them. All right, I'll start reading the next example. So um, this says that they have two children on the spectrum and each is at a different level of development. Um, it can be hard to create play situations that they both enjoy. I can imagine that's pretty difficult. There's only one of me until my husband can get home on the weekend. So yeah, that is really difficult. Um, depending on where they are in their stages of play, you could potentially set up different play areas or different play activities for them that meet their needs and their interests. Um, or um, you could think creatively about the items that they do like to engage with, um, maybe not together, but maybe they can play with the same items in the same room at least so that you're able to facilitate play and kind of bounce back and forth between um, each of your children. Did you have anything else to add, Christina? Uh, I was thinking that maybe, you know, there's an opportunity that you can have one child sort of help the other child to play. I know um, that being able to take a role in helping is sometimes uh, positive for, for one of the children. And so giving them an opportunity to help to make the play fun for one of the children. And then for the child that did help, you know, kind of getting involved with them maybe as the other child plays with something different so that you can also meet their needs and teach them a little bit of extra stuff in play too. Yeah, that's a great idea. Another example we have, um, something you guys shared is gaining attention. So gaining attention in the first place is challenging, but keeping it once he's engaged is tough. So yeah, I my biggest piece of advice I feel like would be to just sit back and observe what um, he really likes to do within play with the items that he has and just get creative about the, the ways that you can start to engage yourself. Because if you can go in there making something extra fun, then that's going to um, get his attention and hopefully maintain that attention for you to be able to teach those new skill areas. Yeah. Another thing to that is being able to to kind of be in control of the thing that makes that toy fun. Um, the biggest thing I think of is blowing bubbles, right? So if you're blowing bubbles, they kind of need you to help make that activity fun. And so trying to find a way that you can get, gain control of um, being able to facilitate the play for sure. Yeah, another one is how can I help a child settle into an activity instead of going from one material to another? Um, a great way to do that is to focus on setting up your environment. So find an environment with minimal distractions or maybe putting the rest of the toys that you think might be desirable for your child in a bin and placing that in another room um, just while you focus on one play activity at a time. That could be a great way to minimize those distractions so that they aren't, your child isn't able to bounce around to all of those different activities. Did you have anything else to add with that one, Christina? No, oh, that was a solid, um, solid response. Um, the next one is a goal would be to have um, them give me one of the toys so that you guys could play together. So like we mentioned um, before, the turn-taking, trying to have many different um, objects that you guys can engage with back and forth, or even holding something that he is interested in um, that he's maybe not currently playing with and then exchanging that with him whenever you're asking him to give up his preferred item, that could be a really great way to do that um, without disrupting his, um, his play or making him engage in any type of challenging behavior over that exchange. And then this last one says, working with children, not one specific, most um, if someone comes over to play or interact, one child's play is aggressive and he'll try to take away toys or hit. Um, and then, yeah, just challenging behavior can happen if the toy has to be removed. 
And that can be really challenging as well. I would say um, it's important to make sure that everyone's safety is the priority for that example. And that child just may not be ready for that skill. Um, so it may just be more important to work on that skill in isolation just with that child alone before bringing in peers or siblings. Um, you know, you as an adult are able to manage that situation better than a peer or sibling would be able to, and you're able to manage that safety a little better. So that would be my recommendation. Christina, do you have anything to add for that one? Um, only to the to the point of the meltdown, right? We don't want to think of it as, you know, they, the child wants to be disruptive or they, they want to have this meltdown, right? So this is a way that they're trying to communicate to you that something isn't going the way that they had planned or intended or wanted. And so I think trying to really pinpoint what that thing is and help the child to communicate that appropriately. Um, and then, you know, giving them opportunities to access that item when they can, when they can explain that or even use one word because they want toy, even if that's what it is. Yeah, that's great. So now that we've thoroughly discussed the different aspects of playing with your child, let's review some examples of what that play might look like. So if your child is wanting to engage in a puzzle or that's something that you want your child to start engaging in, Things you could focus on are imitating putting in a puzzle piece. So like Christina mentioned before, providing that model of what the expectation is can be really important if the expectation isn't already clear for them. You could also work on handing your child the pieces. So if they aren't able to tolerate your interaction with that item, but they are really motivated to play with the puzzle, you wouldn't have to do anything else besides just hand them the pieces as they're putting them in. Um, you could also work on independent functional play. So just making sure that they are able to complete the puzzle on their own or just following simple directions like turn the piece or put it here. Yes, and um, to the point of the puzzles, there are so many different types of puzzles. So the biggest thing is just finding your child's sweet spot of puzzles that are challenging but atta attainable for them, um, whether that is an, an identical board puzzle that has matching shapes that go in or a jigsaw puzzle, as you can see in the picture here. Uh, there's this little middle point where they're really great at inset puzzles, but not quite at jigsaw puzzles yet. And I, I really like the two piece puzzles. You can get them heads and tails or different types of transportation and they're just two pieces that make one whole puzzle. And those are definitely some of my favorites to start with. So another toy that you might wanna use is a cause and effect toy. And some different things that you could focus on here are imitating pushing the different colored buttons. So you push the buttons and then your child pushes the buttons as well. You could label the different colors or say, where's the yellow? find the purple. You could take turns. So you could hit some buttons and then you could give it to them to hit the buttons. You could just work on remaining seated while playing, while sitting next to your child. So remaining seated could be something that's difficult for your child, but also sitting next to a person or having you engage with them um, could be difficult. So you could just work on that. And you could also work on tolerating you pushing the button. So if your child's pushing, maybe you just interject with pushing one button and then kind of fade out, um, trying to ease yourself into that activity. Yeah, and exploratory play is one of the first stages of play that, that most kids really start with. And one thing to consider is how many actions that toy can do. Uh, for most kids, it's, it's easiest to learn a toy when there's only one action to start. So it might be pushing buttons or it might be putting a coin into a slot. It might be putting a ball down a ball ramp, um, but those sort of cause effect toys and getting to explore the effect that occurs is, is a really good starting place for kids, especially ones that are engaging in more of that solitary play. Um, it's a way for you to, to meet them where they're at and even play with a toy just next to them that has that same sort of effect. Another toy we'll talk about is blocks. So 
when you're playing with blocks, some things that you could focus on are turn taking. We've mentioned this a lot. You, you have lots of different block pieces. So this is an easy activity to work on that turn taking since you have all of those materials to be able to um, repetitively work on that turn taking. You could just work on following simple directions like putting it on top, knock the tower down. You could sort the different colors. So you could make a tower of blue blocks and a tower of yellow blocks and a tower of orange blocks. You could work on object substitution here um, and pretend play. So you could um, make the, the blocks into a phone or you could make it into a shopping cart or however creative you can get. Um, you can just do whatever seems appropriate for your child and their um, interests. You could also work on counting the different blocks. One thing that I love about blocks so much is they're, they're kind of a growing toy, meaning that the way you play with them grows and evolve, evolves as your child grows and learns new things. Um, it's definitely one of my staple toys to have in the area for, for your child because it, it has so much flexibility and can be very pivotal to whichever play stage they're at. Um, next, we'll talk about a farm toy. So some things that you could focus on here are imitation with objects. This would be a really good toy um, for targeting that toy variance because you could push the tractor around the farm. You could make the animals um, do different actions and do different things with the barn. You could also talk about the different sounds that the animals make. Um, you could fill in the missing words of a song. So you could be singing Old MacDonald. And then once you pick up a, um, an animal, they can tell you which animal they want to talk about next as you're singing the song. You could label the different animals or the different parts of a barn. And then you could also just have a conversation about the different things that you do or find on a bar on a farm. These, these type of toys are super important for children, especially when it relates to things that they're experiencing in their everyday lives. So going to the barn or going to the grocery store, different toys or pretend play toys that allow them to kind of rehearse and react, reenact things that they've done um, on the weekends or, or different things that you have done with them. And then the last example we're gonna talk about is ball play. So some things you could focus on, and obviously there's different versions of balls. They could be different sizes. They could be, there could be a lot of them. There could be one of them, um, but you can imitate actions with the ball, such as throwing, kicking, bouncing, rolling the ball, something that would be functional. You could also work on turn taking. You could sort the balls by color or size. You could work on teaching them a cooperative game like bowling or basketball. And then you could also get really creative um, and focus on some pretend play by painting the balls. And let's say you paint the ball and then you slam it down onto a piece of paper and make different circle patterns or see how, how far the paint can splatter. You could use the balls as glasses like these kids are doing in this picture. Um, or you could balance on the balls and pretend the floor is lava. Um, really, the item is just the item and you can get as creative as you want to by using it. I, I don't have much extension on this, just that they are similar to um, blocks. They can kind of grow and play can evolve as your child learns. And now we're just going to go through some frequently asked questions um, related to play. So I said we would talk about this, but what about technology? So while there's nothing wrong with using technology when you need to, avoiding the use of technology when targeting these play skills is important because it impedes attention to others in the environment. When um, your child is engaged in technology, they're likely just really tuned in to that iPad, that TV. They're not really engaged in the rest of their environment. So they're not attending to those different things that they could observe in their environment. And it can be difficult to control or manipulate. So it's likely that if your child um, is really into the iPad or the computer or TV, that it's hard for you to take that away or remove that. 
Um, so if you were trying to use that as a way to engage in play, your child may not tolerate um, the removal or the denial to that item as easily. So instead of using technology during play, you could use it as a reinforcer or a reward for engaging in separate play tasks. So you could say, first, we're gonna play with blocks and then you can have your iPad. Um, it's also important to provide clear guidelines for how long and when your child will access that technology. So if you are using that as a reinforcer, but let's say you wanna reward something that they've done within play, but you only want them to have the iPad for one minute, make that clear to them. You could use a timer to show them how much time they have. You could just clearly define that expectation, but you wanna make sure that they are not caught off guard by you removing that if you are using that as a reinforcer. And what if my teaching is not working? So it could be that you selected a skill or a goal that is too difficult like we mentioned before, try to choose something that's really attainable for your child. Um, it's also possible that your child is not motivated enough for the reinforcer that you selected. So if this happens, you could try selecting an easier skill using the same materials. So just change your um, skill to something easier. You could switch out the materials if they um, aren't as interested in blocks and now they wanna move on to the balls. Maybe there's something you can teach there that would be similar to what you were gonna teach with the blocks and you could just use the different materials. You could also manipulate the environment like we've talked about. You could remove those other toys if they're rotating between a lot of toys and they're not really focused on one thing. You could just try to set up your environment a little better or think about what reinforcer you are providing. And if they don't really seem that interested in it, then it's not really acting as a reinforcer and it doesn't really have that value to them. So try to spend a little time finding something that they do wanna work for, and then you can provide that reinforcer um, and see if that helps you um, get, get a better handle on, um, on them completing that task. And then if you run out of ideas, you can reach out to your behavior analyst for help. And if you're not a current family or current client, we'll talk about who you can reach out to in um, the next couple of slides. This slide actually. So if you're a current ABA family, you're gonna contact your behavior analyst for any of your child specific questions. They're gonna know your child already and they're gonna um, know some things that your child enjoys or where their play skills are in the current moment. So that would be a really great resource for you. If you're an interim care family, you can contact your interim care behavior analyst. If you're on the wait list, you can contact your clinical director um, at whatever location you're interested in your child going to. And we also have an email address for any other families. It's just info at beermanaba.com. And you can always use that as a resource as well. So some of the key takeaways of this training are to create your goal and keep that in mind throughout um, when you're teaching your new play skills. You wanna select appropriate toys, set up the environment, and just be observant and involved and adjust your interactions based on um, your child and be flexible within the expectations that you set up and just meet them where they are. Um, so, to talk about some of the upcoming webinars, on May 5th, we're going to do an introduction to ABA and speech language services, if that's something you're interested in. And on May 19th, we're gonna have a discussion on change, and that is helping your child navigate changes that arise due to holidays, vacations, or changes in routine. And you can access all of the upcoming webinars on um, the Beerman website. If you go to the website and go to caregiver training, you can find all of them there, or you can use this link. After this presentation, this presentation is recorded and put on our YouTube channel, so you can always access it there, but you will also be emailed a copy of this presentation as well for you to reference. And then like I mentioned before, they're not listed on this slide, but in um, starting in, 
June, we are going to start a play series um, that will dive in a little bit deeper to those different aspects of play that we talked about, like sibling and peer play or pretend play. So if you're interested in learning more, please look for those and attend those as well. So thank you guys so much for all of your participation throughout this webinar. If you have questions for us um, that are specific to this play content, Christina and I will hang out for um, a few more minutes and answer any questions that you guys might have. Okay, this says, can I get a certificate of attendance with the date and time and webinar duration time? Um, I am not sure about accessing that, but I can reach out and email um, somebody who might know the answer to that. And I will just make sure that I write down your information and let them know that you're interested in that. Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Yeah, this is such a fun topic to discuss. I love thinking of all the different ways that you can get creative with your kids within play. Yes, definitely refer um, any, any colleagues or friends to the YouTube channel. This will be available there. I did um, just get somewhat of an answer. If, um, if you're asking for if this is a CEU, um, our webinars are not eligible um, for them, if that's what you're asking, if it's for CEU purposes. Um, but if not, just let me know and I can still try to get that information for you. Um, someone just said they're also interested in ABA and OT. Um, we also offer webinars. We've offered a few already. So if you want to look at that YouTube channel for any of that specific content, you are welcome to go there. But I do know we will have um, some more webinars that include OT as a specialty as well. All right, and I wrote down your email too. I'll make sure that I get a clearer answer for you and let you know about, um, about that attendance information. You are so welcome. Thank you for attending. All right, if nobody has any other questions, then we're gonna go ahead and log off, but thank you guys so much for participating and hopefully we see you guys again soon. Kelsey, thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, thank you, this was fun. I appreciate all of your collaboration. Of course, have a good night. You too.